Hi everyone, this is Dan Johnston, the Jack of All Ministries, and today we are talking about soundproofing materials. You know, in the midst of doing my studio project, I started look, doing research on all these different products, and you hear everything from people saying, oh, you know what, get the green glue, because that stuff works wonders when it's between drywall. And others will say, no, no, you need to go out and get this mass-loaded vinyl. While others will say, oh, you know what, the best thing is to get this special insulation, this Rockwell Safe and Sound, which has metal slag and wool or whatever in it, when other people will say, no, just get the regular old um, insulation that you can pick up from Lowe's or Menards or Home Depot or whatever. Well, I decided that what I was going to do was test all of these things in my garage. I came up with a test that, although it's not going to give you perfect results like you would in a laboratory, it is going to be able to let you compare these things side by side in a very cost-effective way, especially when you consider the fact that you could be spending thousands upon thousands of dollars for these materials, and if you're going to do that, you should probably figure out if they're going to actually stand up to the hype. So let me show you how I did my test and how you can replicate it yourself. When I started testing these things, I wanted to come up with a way to experiment that was gonna be easy and it was gonna be inexpensive. And I wanted it to be repeatable. So I figured that I could put this on the channel that anybody who is thinking about doing some soundproofing and needs to test their own materials, you can copy this same test and find out just how good it's going to do. And so what I did was I took these brick pavers, I built a little structure out of them, I put a little Bluetooth speaker in there, I sealed everything up with foam, and then I put this foam tape around the top so that I could take the materials that I wanted to test, lay them across it, press it down with other bricks, and then play the, the different frequencies through the material and test them with this sound meter. When it comes to being cheap, I feel like I accomplished my goal. Each of these paver stones was found in my backyard, but you can buy them at Lowe's for a couple of bucks each. The spray foam was like $8 for a can. And then the decibel meter is one that I had lying around at church, but you can buy them on Amazon for under $20. You can also use your phone, but I find that those are pretty inaccurate, so I'd really recommend getting yourself a real dedicated decibel meter. So to play the tones, I hooked up my Bluetooth speaker to my laptop, and I went to this website that I can't pronounce, but basically it's an online tone generator. I'll put a link down in the description if you want to go there. Um, and basically I set each of these up to play the frequencies that I needed with all the different STC numbers. You can see them right here, beginning at 125 hertz, 160, 200, works its, works its way all the way up to 4000 hertz. Now, the thing that makes this test accurate is you have to make sure that each of these tones is played at the same volume as each other. And when you're using a Bluetooth speaker, as you can imagine, one this small struggles playing lower frequencies. And so what I had to do was I played the lowest frequency that I would use, the 125 hertz, and I played it to see just how loud this speaker could, could play it. Turns out it's just over 70 decibels. And so what I did was I opened up a bunch of tabs in my browser and I made all of the tones preset to each of the frequencies that I need for the STC band. I also changed the volume on each frequency so that it all ended up playing at 70 decibels each. That way the test would be accurate across the spectrum. Then I took my sound material, I placed it on top of the bricks, covered it with the other bricks to hold it down nice and tight, and then I played the tones. So I'll start here with 125 hertz, okay, the bottom of the STC scale. All right, so I got my 125 hertz tone, tone. Watch what happens when I set this drywall over the hole. Instant difference, right? Now the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna seal this thing up. Big difference there. making sure not to cover any part of the hole. All right, make sure my decibel meter can read. So I play the tone. Then I check the number on my decibel meter to see where that tone is playing. And then I come in here into my Studio Project Excel spreadsheet here, and then I'll type in what that number is. And then I go on to the next tab, and do it for 160, play the tone. Then I do it for 200, and then I do it for 250, and 315, and all the way up. And as I fill in the spreadsheet here, I now have it assigned to make a graph. 
Now this black line shows my original test numbers, right? Remember I was able to get everything from 125 hertz on up to balance out at 70.3 decibels. Now playing the same tones at the same volumes, after changing the, the materials, you can see what then the new materials were able to do, what kind of sound dampening there happened to be. So again, this test isn't intended to be perfect like it would be in a laboratory setting. This is supposed to be something that you can affordably do on your own at home and give you reasonably useful results. It's not going to give you an actual STC rating because, of course, you have to worry about atmospheric conditions. You have to worry about certain types of leakage. Um, using just um, cinder blocks is going to create an opportunity for some you know, vibrational transfer, some impact noise, if you will, as it's just sitting on paper towels, which is going to touch the concrete, which is touching directly into the cinder blocks, and then the material. So there could be some resonance going on and things like that. But the truth is, every material that I use is going to be put through the exact same circumstances and the exact same conditions. So at least we'll be able to compare apples to apples, even if it doesn't give us an actual STC rating. If mass-loaded vinyl is worth the hype, we should see a difference when it's set up next to just a single sheet of drywall, especially if you're going to be spending hundreds of dollars per roll of that stuff. If green glue makes such a difference and you're going to be squirting out $16 of this stuff on every sheet of drywall, then you would expect that you should see a difference when they're compared side by side, even if the test conditions aren't perfect. The materials I decided to test were ones that had either a good chance of being used in my studio build or ones that I had a question about or I wanted to do an experiment for. And so basically I started with just a regular sheet of 5 8 inch Type X drywall which is the common material you use when you build you know, drywall soundproof structures. Then I put a double sheet of 5 8 inch drywall. And then I used Rockwell Safe and Sound insulation inside the cavity with a double sheet of 5 8 inch drywall on top. And then I did R13 insulation the same way. Now it's time to test this eighth inch mass loaded vinyl. We'll see, uh, we'll do it loose first, so kind of hung on the inside of the drywall, and then we'll sandwich it in between and see if that makes a difference. Oops. The next product I want to talk to you about is one that if you're researching soundproofing, you're definitely going to be hearing about. It's called green glue. And really, you're supposed to spray two 29-ounce tubes per 4x8 sheet of drywall. That's a lot of glue. And what happens is when you spray it in there, it's supposed to give you these outrageously good STC ratings. This stuff is basically saving the world in terms of soundproofing. Um, I just don't know that this stuff is going to work that great, just putting a, a putty or some type of soft material between sheets of drywall. But we're going to try it out and we're going to do it according to the manufacturer's specifications. One tube covers half a sheet, so that's 16 square feet. Um, so that means that I need to use 1 16th of this tube. Basically, I did the math and figured out that I need to use about an inch and a half um, of this tube on that one foot square. And then as I tighten this up and get it ready, I already measured off this gap. So an inch and a half right here, as soon as that tape touches the bottom, I know that I've used the right amount of glue according to the manufacturer, manufacturer's specifications. So they say to go around, oh, that stuff really comes up pretty quick. They say to go around the edge first. Okay. And you really got to use a lot of this stuff, don't you? And they say on the thing, it says, do it in a uniform but random pattern. Okay, and that's it right there. That's the amount of green glue that it, that you should have on there. And I'm going to go ahead and sandwich it up. So now I'm really excited to test this next product, one that I came up with myself, which may be a total fail, but really it's good to know no matter how you look at it. It's outdoor carpeting. It was $10 for a 6x8 sheet, I think. 6x10? I think it was a 6x8 sheet. And so I'm really curious to see, I don't expect it to perform as well as green glue or mass loaded vinyl, um, but I am interested to see how close it actually gets for $10, um, because obviously that's a lot cheaper per square foot than the other two are. So as I started testing the carpet sample, I realized that it was not going to be a fair test. There's no way to actually test the carpet in a fair way because what happens is I'm creating a seal between the foam barrier on top of the bricks and the drywall which seals to prevent sound from coming out. 
Well, when you put carpet in between there, well, the carpet is ridged, okay? So that just creates air gaps all the way around. So you, you can't really get a good seal on it. And so what I've done now is I've jumped ahead to the sandwiching portion to see how it tests when it's sandwiched between drywall. And I'm just gonna have to skip the loose installed carpet, which is actually what I plan to do in the house. In doing research for this build, I talked to a guy named Dennis Foley from AcousticFields.com, and he is a genius when it comes to building studios and figuring out the dynamics of sound. And so in talking to him, they sell a product which has activated carbon, which really, really helps in the lower frequencies. And so I thought, activated carbon, is there something about the activation of it that has to do with soundproofing? Or can you use something a little more normal that you could buy in the store, like maybe charcoal. So I'm going to go ahead and smash this up and put it in there as a filter and see what this does and hopefully it gives us better results at the lower frequency. So let's find out. So the next product I want to look at is just to give us an idea of variance between regular finishing materials. I'm going to test just a regular three quarter inch sheet of MDF and just see what that looks like in comparison to the drywall. So the last thing that I want to take a look at is I want to see if there's a way to find a cheaper substitute for green glue. Now there's another brand out there called Quiet Glue Pro and I couldn't seem to get my hands on it without buying it in bulk. And so what I decided to do was go ahead and test the green glue first and then see if I could find something comparable to green glue. Now I came across a video on YouTube that showed a green glue versus a Quiet Glue Pro comparison. And the problem was there really wasn't a whole lot of scientific testing or anything like that that really showed anything. Thing. And if you look at some of the tests that people have done, a lot of people will say that quiet glue is actually better. And the reason why I think that might be is because quiet glue is tackier and stays thinner longer. And actually in the video that I saw, the guy installed some quiet glue and it actually ran out of the drywall onto the floor, which may not be too big of a problem, especially if you seal your baseboards, but I could see it becoming an issue if it all slowly sinks to the bottom of your drywall over time, leaving big gaps up at the top. And so in the video, the guy said that he heard from a studio builder or an engineer or something like that, that you can use carpet glue. So I went ahead and I bought some indoor outdoor carpet adhesive and then some general use multi-floor adhesive from Lowe's. I want to test both of these out once they've had a chance to kind of dry up just a little bit. And I want to see how good these perform compared to the green glue. And you can actually see how this stuff stays tacky over time because that's been able to dry on the outside. And these are just uh, eighth inch by eighth inch square notch troughs. I think this one's a little bit thinner. All right, and the last thing I'm going to do now that I'm finished with the testing is I'm going to put two cinder blocks on the top and seal them up with the Great Stuff foam um, the same way I did for the outer perimeter. The reason I want to do that is because every test with the drywall and MDF and insulation and whatever I'm putting on there has to work in conjunction with the cinder blocks that I already put there. So I want to put the cinder blocks on top and seal it just like the sides to show us how much of the work is being done by that. Um, that way we can kind of have a comparison to see, because it might be unfair if there's a lot of noise bleed coming out of those bricks, then it may not only be because of the stuff we're using. So we're going to take a look at that and see how that looks. I'm particularly interested around the 2500 cycle range because that seems to be where the volume is outrageously loud for some reason. The only thing I can think is maybe the particular dimensions of that combined with the materials have kind of turned it into a resonator at that frequency. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to calculate the room modes or whatever for something that small, but I'm wondering if that might be what it is. So anyway, I'm looking forward to seeing what that looks like with the cinder blocks on top. So after all these tests, what exactly did I find out? Well, it turns out that the results are pretty interesting. The biggest finding that I have is that Basically, as long as you're doing something, you're going to get a result, and if you do more, it's not going to make as big a difference as you would probably hope for.
Now, some of the specialty materials do make a difference. I noticed that the mass loaded vinyl seemed to be pretty significant. I noticed that adding carpet seemed to be pretty significant. But I also noticed that the green glue test came back performing very, very poorly. And I actually have trouble believing that. I don't think that green glue makes as big a difference as you would, as you, they probably promise on their website. Uh, what I actually think is that it's so close that doing it in my garage was inaccurate enough to skew the numbers by one or two decibels. So really, it's, I don't think it's worth spending all the extra money to buy the specialty fancy products. I think that the replacements actually do pretty well. I feel like the carpet glue competed very well against the green glue, and according to my tests, it actually did better. So I'm gonna go ahead and use that on my project. I also noticed that the R13 insulation did just as well as the rock wool or even better as well. And so I'm gonna use the R13 where I can, but I'm gonna use the rock wool in the ceiling because I'm really concerned about the impact noise and I feel like the density might stop the vibration of the joists up above. It's really not that big of an increase in cost and I think that it might be worth it just to try it out. I'm gonna also use the carpet in my build because I feel like you may as well use it if it's really inexpensive. One thing that I would really like for you to take away from this video is I think you need to be careful about the gimmicks that some of these companies actually use to try to sell their stuff. You take a look at Green Glue's website and they tell you that their superior technology actually uses their material to convert sound wave energy into heat energy and that's why they soundproof so well. But let me tell you something. Virtually everything in the universe that has mass does that exact same thing. That's just a regular principle of physics. When sound waves are traveling and they hit an object, their energy starts to diminish, diminish and it just converts into heat. That happens with every material, so that means that your desk does it, your pillow does it, your body does it, and even your dog does it. So it's really not a big deal that green glue also does it. Also, if you take a look at some of these materials that have like special acoustic foam that comes down and, and covers up these special noises, you'll notice a lot of times in those videos they used high pitch frequencies to demonstrate the amount of noise that they cut out. Well, I'll tell you this, high pitch frequencies are very easy to stop in comparison to low pitch frequencies. I found out in my studio that when you stand in the hallway and you turn on a speaker, you can almost not hear the music no matter how loud it is. However, when you go all the way upstairs, you can still hear my kick drum and my toms vibrating because they are at lower frequencies. And one more thing, if you really, really need to soundproof a room, the only way that you're really going to have superior results is if you use things that are made with really, really heavy mass. I'm talking concrete and brick and things like that because that's what it actually takes to stop sound. But even then, my understanding is that it's not perfect. When I was on a phone call with Dennis Foley, he told me that he once built a structure using three foot thick concrete walls that were separated by air gaps and they were still finding bleed at the 30 hertz level. So that should tell you something, that low frequency sound has a really, really good ability at transferring through things. Just ask my wife. She can hear my drums all the time. And there you have it. If this video was helpful, I'd appreciate it if you'd like it and consider subscribing to my channel because this is the kind of stuff that I like to tackle. And with that, I hope that you guys have a good day and we'll see you on the next video.